we're going to talk about particle kinematics. And this is related to chapter one of the textbook. I do want you to get a fourth edition. So chapter one of Schaub and Junkins. And let's just dive in. So we're talking about particle kinematics first. So kinematics is usually broken down into two different things. There's you know, particle kinematics and rigid body kinematics. Um, and we're gonna be first talking about particle kinematics, which is gonna be complicated in and of itself. Um, all right. So first we'll talk about reference frames and how that works. Right? We choose a reference frame would be something like, we'll, we're gonna start with particle kinematics. If we have a particle, let's say a point P, and we want to describe where it is in three-dimensional space, then we would define a, a reference frame. So I'll just use uh, an, an origin and then three directions. I'm gonna call them E1, E2, and E3. And I'll typically put uh, a little hat so all unit vectors are gonna be labeled with that little, you know, triangle, call it a hat. And if we want to describe where is this vector, where, where is P with respect to this origin? Then, then we can do that. hearing some sound. So this is the origin, we'll call this the a frame. The book will call this a, it's kind of a script E, I'll just use normal E. This E frame would be an origin, which we could put O or maybe put O sub E if we want. And then a triad of unit vectors, which form a right-handed coordinate system. Okay, so this is what we were talking about last time, a triad of unit vectors. It's right-handed in the sense that, uh, and we usually list them in this order. So E1, E2, E3 is gonna be E1 cross E2 using the right hand rule. So remember, use your right hand. If we do E1 cross E2, so we fold inward, our thumb is pointing in that third direction. So it's right handed. This vector, we could call it OE to P if we want with a, with a line over it. That's a notation that the book will sometimes use. I mean, more often we'll write it as a vector like R. So the vector R is a vector pointing from the coordinate origin to the point P, okay? And let's let the, uh, the coordinate of R along the E1 direction be called X, the coordinate of R along the E2 direction we'll call Y, and then the coordinate of R along the E3 direction we'll call Z. So I'm going to represent this is Z, this is, if we were to extend out in these unit vector directions, right? This is X and then this is Y. So we would write the vector R as being, it's a distance X or amount X in the E1 direction plus 
distance y in the e2 direction plus a distance z in the e3 direction. So we would say um, that the we're writing the vector r in the with respect to the e frame, and it has components x, y, and z. So another way that we might write r, and this is a form that the book will ad adopt, we could write it as a column vector. And to remind ourselves that we're writing this with respect to the e frame, we'll put a superscript e, and then we could write this as a column vector x, y, z. And then we'll put the superscript there as, as well. So that's just a, another way to write it. That'll be more convenient when we do matrix manipulations a little bit later on. Okay. So notice the this is a a three vector, or we would say a three by one column vector. And the ith entry here is you know gives the ith coordinate. All right. Now, suppose we had another vector. I guess I'll just kind of add it on here in orange. If I had a vector uh, P, I'll call this the P vector. And P R plus P equals Q then it's true that we could write Q equals R plus P because we haven't specified what the coordinates are. So this is just vector addition, but suppose I had a different frame. If I wrote the P vector with respect to a different frame, so I'm just gonna make up some crazy frame here. Um, maybe I'll write this as I'll do some other frame. So this is like B1, B2, and B3. Those are Bs. Then if I were to write the components of Q, Q1, Q2, Q3, with respect to the E frame, and then the components of R as R1, R2, R3. But if I wrote the components of P, P1, P2, P3, with respect to the B frame, well then this vector addition is not, is not true. So this would not be correct. Not correct. If you're gonna do vector addition, or in general, any vector manipulations, they all have to be written with respect to the same frame. Okay. And then there are ways to relate the different frames as we'll get to. All right. So that's just some basics on describing a vector and notation that we'll use. Uh, we're gonna say a lot more about three three dimensional vectors because kinematics of particles, getting the kinematics of particles in 3D correct goes a long way towards getting the kinematics of rigid bodies correct. All right, there are some other coordinate systems, right? We would call this coordinate system we've shown in red, this E-frame, we'd call this a Cartesian coordinate system, but of course there are others. So we could, you know, the above was, the above E-frame is a Cartesian coordinate frame. It's the usual one, right? We write things in terms of X, Y, and Z, but there are others. And this, these become convenient if you have different types of symmetry or if you're looking at the motion of a spacecraft around the earth, um, you might wanna use different types of coordinates. So two other types of coordinate systems that I, I'm gonna mention are cylindrical and spherical. First, let's talk about the cylindrical coordinate frame. And for the cylindrical coordinate frame, uh, maybe I'll just start with, it's describing say the same particle P or point P 
we've got the same Cartesian frame. Same origin, uh, but it might be more convenient to use a different frame. So the, the cylindrical coordinate frame looks at this vector from the origin to where P is, vector R, but we're basically doing polar coordinates within the E1, E2 frame. So we project down into the E1, E2 frame, and we let that define a new direction. So along this line uh, from the origin to that pro projected point, we've got a unit vector that we'll call C sub D. Okay. And then that C sub D is rotated with respect to the E1 frame through an angle theta. The unit vector that increases in the direction that theta is increasing, we call uh, C sub theta. So C sub theta is gonna be some vector C sub theta here. So we've got C D and C theta are essentially polar coordinates, coordinate vectors, unit vectors in the E1, E2 plane. And then to compete, complete the right-handed coordinate system, if we're talking about, let's, let's write C, that's my fancy C, the C frame. It's got the same origin. And then if we have CD as the first listed unit vector of the triad, and then C theta, completing the right-handed coordinate system. So I use my right hand, CD cross C theta. My thumb should still be pointing in the uh, up direction, E3. So E3 and C3 are the same direction. So this equals E3. So the only difference really is in the first two and their, their polar coordinates. Okay, so we could write, you could think of this as, a, you know, there's a unit vector. This is just giving the directions, the same directions, but showing them here. This is, this dot there, that's the uh, vector P of P, point P projected, not projected, projected. to the E1, E2 plane. All right. And we could, we could work out how uh, the unit vectors of the E frame, so E1, E2, E3, how are they related to the unit vectors of the um, C frame, cylindrical coordinate frame. Uh, we could also write what the vector R is. If we were to write the vector R in terms of the cylindrical coordinate frame, this is given by, we'll call this distance along from O to this projected point, we'll call that D. So we have an amount D in the C, D direction plus this is still Z, Z in the C3 direction. So writing this um, in a the C frame as a set of, as a column vector, we'd have D zero Z, okay? But it represents the same vector. If you look in detail at um, you know, how are the C, D, C, theta directions related 
to the Cartesian E1, E2 directions. Let's, let's maybe write them this way. So now we're just gonna be looking in that plane. And in that plane, we've got E1, E2, and in blue, right, I've got C, D, and perpendicular to that, right, this is perpendicular, C, theta. This angle is theta. So of course, this angle is also theta. So through a, a little bit of trig, we could work out how these unit vectors are, are related. So we'll write, um, I'll write CD is equal to, and I'll write it this way. It's a sum I goes from one to two of CD dotted with EI in the EI direction. So this would be CD dotted with E1 in the E1 direction plus CD dotted with E2 in the E2 direction. What is CD dotted with E1? So CD dotted with E1, going over here to this diagram, it's the projection of CD onto E1 and that's cosine theta. This is cosine theta. What about CD projected onto E2? That would be that amount. That is sine theta. So we've got cosine theta in the E1 direction plus sine theta in the E2 direction. That's what CD is. And we could do something similar for C theta. So we've got C theta. And what we'll get is negative sine theta, E1, plus cosine theta, E2. So it looks like they're related by a rotation. It's, it's sometimes convenient to write a table. So let's, let's make a table relating these unit vectors. So I'll put C D and C theta as uh, rows, and then E one, E two as columns, and then each side the entries of this table will be putting the dot product of the two vectors. So in this upper left hand one, this would be C D dotted with E one. This is CD dotted with E2. Down here, C theta dotted with E1 and C theta dotted with E2. And so what, what will this give? Let me just repeat it over here with those sines and cosines. because we've worked out what these dot products are. So this is cosine theta, sine theta, negative sine theta, cosine theta. So we can go directly from this table to writing a sort of a matrix representation relating the unit vectors. Oh, but we could turn this into a matrix relationship. What do I mean by that? Um, we'll write C, D, and C, theta, but we'll view this as a column. And then it'll be related by some two by two matrix to E1 and E2 written again as a, as a column. 
And it's just literally reading off the entries of this matrix. So we've got cosine theta, sine theta, negative sine theta, cosine theta. And so you'll probably notice, you know, what is this? This looks like a rotation matrix through an angle theta. So I'll just, uh, it's a matrix M through an angle theta. Okay, this is a rotation matrix. And knowing that we could actually get, uh, if we wanted to reverse this, right? What is E1 and E2 in terms of CD and C theta? It's going to be cosine theta, negative sine theta, sine theta, cosine theta times C D C theta. And over here, it looks like, well, just the minus sign on the sign flipped, but really this is that matrix transpose. The, so cylindrical coordinates, the Z component, that third one is always the same. It's the, all the actions happening in the plane and in the plane, it's basically polar coordinates. Okay. You might, why might you wanna use cylindrical coordinates um, if you've got some kind of rotational symmetry to a system like uh, particles moving on a cylinder, but it also is convenient in other cases. Probably more convenient for orbital mechanics is the, the spherical coordinate system as opposed to the cylindrical coordinate system. But I, let me stay on the cylindrical coordinates. Just if you look at the little movie of where I am. So red, this is the, the E frame, the Car Cartesian frame. And then blue, let's say this is a, uh, the cylindrical coordinate frame. The cylindrical coordinate frame is related to the Cartesian frame just through a rotation about the third direction by an angle theta. So there's our angle theta. So this sort of introduces the idea of a, there's a rotation going on. For spherical coordinates, we now not only rotate about that Z direction, now we rotate through another direction so that uh, one of our unit vectors is actually pointing at the particle P. So that was cylindrical. Now we go to spherical. Spherical coordinate frame. It has another rotation. So we have a unit vector pointing at P. So for the for spherical coordinates, it's a bit harder to draw. So I'm just going to bring in the image from the book. Kind of relates all of them. Um, maybe I'll try to use my same color scheme, not their wacky color scheme. So E, we got our E directions. E1, E2, E3, the origin's the same. Point P's out here. There's our vector R. And now, um, unlike the, so cylindrical coordinates would have had a unit vector pointing towards this point down here. We don't have that anymore. We've now rotated our coordinate frame. So now there's a unit vector SR that's pointing in the R direction. So now in spherical coordinates, so the S frame, the S frame, it's got the same origin, but if we were to write what these unit vectors are, they're S R, S theta, and then S phi. And we're writing them in the proper order so that it's again, a right-handed coordinate system. S 
V needs to be S R cross S theta. Which if, if you look at, so over here on the diagram, S R and S theta, take the cross product S R cross S theta, and your thumb should be pointing into S V direction. And then that helps you know what, you know, how this thing's oriented. If we were to write the vector R, the vector R is now just uh, spherical coordinate R. So it's this distance. It's not a bold R, it's just a italics R in the SR direction. All right, so SR is the, is the unit vector from O to P. So it's in the direction of the vector R. So if we were to write this um, in the S frame, we've got coordinates, which are R, and then everything else is zero. That describes the vector. Of course, there are two other coordinates. There's right R, there's theta, there's there's phi, but if you're trying to just describe the vector, oops, we need all you have to do is say the r direction because the sr unit vector is always pointing in that direction. So r, theta, and phi, we would call those spherical coordinates. These up here, sr, s theta, s phi, would be spherical coordinate frame or spherical coordinate unit vectors. And there's a relationship uh, between the SR, S theta, S phi, and the E frame. And you would get it by doing another rotation. Uh, this is sort of a gentle introduction to what Euler angles are. So if we start out, here's our E frame, and here's just a blue frame. Well, Cylindrical coordinates do first a rotation about that z direction through an angle of theta. Okay. And then the spherical coordinates do another rotation so that this vector up here, up in, in the front, will be pointing at where the particle p is. So we rotate through the number two blue unit vector. So now this is S R, S theta, S phi up here. So uh, you could think of it as originally S phi was pointing in the E3 direction, but then it got rotated that way. And if you take into account all of the um, rotations, we could write out, um, we could actually write out a three by three matrix relating S R, S theta, and S V. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna do that, but there'd be like a three by three matrix that's got, you could get this using a bunch of trig identities. And eventually we will do that when we start talking about Euler ang angles, but I'll just give you the, the result here. It's not terribly illuminating. It's equation 1.6 of the book, but anyway. It can be done. And then after I write this, I, I do see that there's a question or two, so I'll get to that. Mm -hmm. D one. I guess there is something I could say, which is the book says this, like this is the spherical coordinate system. Depending on what book or what your application is, you might actually see that there's, there's actually other ways 
to write spherical coordinates. Sometimes the angle is written with respect to the z direction, not from the e1, e2 e plane. The book has chosen that convention because it, it matches latitude and longitude for um, points on the Earth for GPS coordinates. But there, there are th other ways of writing spherical coordinates. There's a mechanical system called the spherical pendulum, which is kind of a, instead of the usual planar pendulum, it's a ball and socket joint. And usually you define the angle with respect to the vertical, not with respect to the X, Y plane, because the vertical direction makes more sense. Uh, so I think that answers one of the questions. Essentially rotating, C, rotating CD. Uh, yeah, yeah. I'd love to find an animation of this because it makes it clear because at first you're like, oh, the spherical coordinate system makes no sense. It's crazy. But no, it, it, yeah, it's what you said. So if we start out, the two frames are aligned. To go to the spherical coordinate frame, we first go to the cylindrical coordinate frame. So now this, the blue arrow down here is, is a CD unit vector. And now we tilt it so that it is now aimed at the point P exactly. So now that's the SR direction. And so we also have an S phi direction, which is increasing in the direction that phi is increasing. You'll get used to this. I found it helpful to get some popsicle sticks and put arrows on them so I could imagine things. You also need a hot glue gun. It's good to have. Um, yeah, I you know, you, you could look at example 1.1 to maybe get some more insight about that. One of the main things that we're going to have to do, um, I know I wish I had a picture of this. Like imagine you've got the spinning earth. There's the spinning earth and a bug. Okay. It's a giant bug. And it's you know moving on the Earth. So the Earth is spinning, and the bug is moving with respect to the spinning Earth. Like, why'd you pick a bug? I don't know. Just thought of a bug. So if you were to describe how the bug is moving, there's multiple frames that we have to keep in mind. There'd be the inertially fixed frame. There'd be the frame attached to the rotating Earth. And so you have to. Um, we're going to have to handle. Uh, describing motion of things. That's the technical term, things. Describing motion of things with respect to a rotating frame. Sometimes multiple rotating frame. And uh, my obscure example, a bug crawling on the earth. There's a, there's a, where did I get this idea of a bug crawling on the earth? Um, there's a paper that's describing as the, as the tectonic plates of the earth move, they're actually changing the mass distribution because they take mountains with them and things. They're changing the mass distribution of the earth. And this paper from like the 1960s was asking, uh, can the plates move in such a way that you'll get some weird rigid body dynamics going on. And so they said, well, imagine a perfect sphere with a giant bugs moving on it. And yes, the rotation of the earth will move somewhat. It's called true polar wander. Maybe we'll talk about that later. All right. Uh, so this just, you know, we're gonna, we're gonna have to talk about rotating frames and rotating frames in 2D is handled a lot easier than in 3D. Um, but you know, that's, that's life. So, you know, dealing with rotating frames. 
It almost seems like they're a nuisance that must be put up with, but they're not. They're actually very good. First, we have to define how a frame is rotating. And that is done typically through something called the, the angular velocity vector. Right, and the angular velocity vector, usually we write this as omega as a vector. It is the, you can think of it as the instantaneous axis of rotation for a frame. And why do I say instantaneous? Because it could change direction the next moment. So the direction of this is the instantaneous axis of rotation of a frame. And its uh, magnitude is the rate, instantaneous rate of rotation And the whole problem of rigid body dynamics is going to become solving for how does this angular velocity vector change in time. But we'll start first with simple cases of uh, steady rotation. Okay. And then how does this change from 2D to 3D? In 2D, right, we could think of there being a, um, for some reason, I, I'm, I, I like using red for some kind of inertially fixed. Cartesian frame. And if we wanted to, here's our point P. If we've got some frame, I'll write it this way. It's kind of, it's kind of, it, it's basically a polar coordinate frame. So this is B1 and B2. Here's theta. So let's say our point P is moving along. You know, it's moving along. So that means the B frame, the B1 direction is tracking how P is moving. And the angular velocity, in this case, uh, we would just think of it as a scalar. The angular velocity of the B frame, that's right, B with respect to E is a scalar. It's a scalar, I mean, not a vector, just a scalar. And it's equal to theta dot. So it's just a rate because it's, it's understood if we were to write the angular velocity vector, the vector of giving the rotation of the B frame with respect to the E frame is theta dot, that's the rate of rotation. And then the direction would be uh, you know E3, which is B3, just coming out of the screen direction. So this definitely gives you, there's the rate, Here's the axis. So even though this is the 2D, this is the planar case, uh, you could think of there being a third direction and that is the axis of rotation of this B-frame, right? The B-frame, I don't even know how to write this, B-frame. So now th there's one thing coming at you and then there's, there's B1, B2. And this through, right? Axis of rotation is pointing at you in the screen there. In TV land. All uh, right, so the three dimensional case, it's a bit harder. Uh, but it can be done, right? If we want to describe a a frame, and I guess it's easier to think of a body, think of a body, a rigid body. And we've got, I'll first write, uh, this red frame is an inertially fixed frame, so it's not attached to the body. 
but now I've got some frame attached to the body. B1, B2, B3. Sometimes I forget to put the little hats on the unit vectors. Um, we could write the, we have to write a vector. There's really no sense in writing a scalar. There's the angular velocity vector. Maybe I'll do that in you know, orange. There's the angular velocity vector of the, the B frame, which is attached to the body with respect to the E frame. And like I said, the angular velocity, this angular velocity vector gives a direction, instantaneous axis of rotation um, and the instantaneous rate of rotation. I don't know what this of a free is. Okay. How do we get some insight about what this is? Um, if we think of instantaneously, I'll, I'll get, bring in a picture that might help. We're going to spend a, a bit of time, most of the class, most of the class trying to understand what 3D rigid body motion would be. But let's just think of it this way. Okay, so there's a point. I've got a blob down here, like an asteroid or something. Rigid body. And there's this uh, E vector. E is the instantaneous axis of rotation. Okay. So this is the instantaneous axis of rotation. And we're looking at a point on the body, uh, which is, we'll label it as P prime. And over a short amount of time, this rotates about that E axis, the axis of rotation to a new location, P double prime. And it rotates through an angle delta theta. So we could write um, that at least in this case of a, a fixed direction, this is giving a, the case of a fixed axis of rotation. Then the angular velocity uh, vector, and it's just sort of, well, you might be confused if I put this, but it is what it is. There's a B frame attached to the body, B for body. And then this is the E frame. This is given by the limit as delta t goes to zero of uh, delta theta in the e times the e direction delta t. Now, typically, that instantaneous axis of rotation will also be moving. Here's another thing that can make rigid body dynamics difficult is the angular velocity vector omega is typically not written in terms of the inertial frame components. So e, the E1, E2 and E3 components, it's usually written in terms of a body fixed frame set of components, which it's not clear now why we would wanna do that, but um, it is something that's done and often not pointed out for how weird it is. So omega, so typically for reasons that were related to rigid body dynamics, the angular velocity is written in terms of the body fixed frame components. There's a figure I can give to illustrate this. It's not the most enlightening, but it's better than nothing. Okay, so here's, we got this script B representing a, the body. And we're writing the omega vector. 
and I just want to write. Um, I don't know why it doesn't why we don't put this. I'm going to put an inertial frame here, an E frame, and then write this omega as B with respect to E. So omega of the B frame with respect to the E frame, you would probably be tempted thinking if we're going to do dynamics, everything has to be in an inertial, written in inertial frame components, but that's not the case for rigid body dynamics. So we'll typically write, you know, omega one, the B one component, omega two, B two, omega three, B three. So we usually write the angular velocity vector in terms of B frame components. For the purposes of rigid body dynamics that way we'll get to later. Okay. And, and maybe you're wondering, why did I jump to this uh, thing about a, a rigid body? Well, here's, here's a key thing. The, uh, the, the geometry and kinematics of rotating frames is exactly the same as the geometry and kinematics of rigid bodies. What did you just say? So kinematics of rotating frames is identical to kinematics of rigid bodies. How is that? Because if we have a rigid body, we can attach a frame to it. So let's say pick the center of mass and then you attach a frame and then describing how this frame rotates with respect to an inertial frame. Describing that is rigid body kinematics or rotating frame kinematics. So I have that if you look at my screen, this is my rigid body. It's a foam block, right? I can take this frame and just, uh, wait, it goes in a certain way. I can attach it, I can attach it to my rigid body. And now, one, uh, the way that I describe how my rigid body is oriented or rigid body kinematics, attitude kinematics is exactly the same as, um, you know, if that body weren't there. It's how does this frame move with respect to this inertially fixed frame? So that is a big simplification. You don't, you know, you just say whatever my rigid body is, no matter the shape, no matter how, how weird it is, I've picked some directions that are attached to the body. And now I can just describe how those directions, B1, B2, B3, change with respect to E1, E2, E3. So this is sort of a, a key thing. If you don't get it yet, that's okay. It's all right. All right. Now we're going to say a little bit more. Yeah, if, uh, if you want to kind, of, if you want to follow along, where are we? Section one point three point two. This is rotation about a fixed axis. And it's useful to think of a rigid body. So here's my rigid body. If I have a point on that rigid body, maybe I'll use this yellow vector to describe from the origin of the rigid body to that point on the rigid body. How does that point, if this, if this rigid body is rotating steadily about some fixed axis, what's the velocity of that point? So to draw a picture, um, pictures are very nice. Here's a picture. 
and I'll drop the notation of omega sub you know, b slash e, just call it omega. Okay, it's the angular velocity vector. So we've got a rigid body. I'll put you know fancy script p. Got a rigid body. That's not fancy enough. That's fancy. Rigid body rotating with uh, angular velocity omega about a fixed axis. That means about a fixed direction. It's just one direction. That direction is not changing. Now, if I have a point, this point P, what is the translational velocity, you know, the usual velocity? Can I see that in orange? Yeah, okay. What is the, you know, translational as opposed to angular, what is the translational velocity of point P? So I'll, I'll write this V. What is V? Here's V. There it is, drew it. Now, okay, how do we figure that out in terms of uh, things we might know about where this point is? So if we've got some origin O and it's along that axis, and then you can imagine, try to imagine looking down from the axis of rotation. And so I will put a crudely drawn eyeball up here. Uh, there we go, it's a crudely drawn eyeball. That's me looking down. It looks like a triangle. Um, so seen looking down from the top. down from the axis of rotation, what path does the point P make? The point P moves in a circle. So it looks like, uh, here's me drawing perfect circle. It looks like, here's point P. There's its instantaneous velocity. It's moving on a circle of radius that I'll call rho. This thing here, this radius is rho. So it goes from there to there. So it looks like the point P moves in a circle of radius row. You're like, well, okay, how do I get row? Um, well, row is R sine theta. Okay. What, what's, what's theta? So theta is the angle. That's, that's a weird way to spell angle. It's the angle between the r vector, right? This is the r vector, r and omega. So the angular velocity vector. So that distance rho um, is uh, r rho equals r sine theta just by geometrical considerations, okay? Uh, the scalar r is the magnitude of this vector r. We're trying to write, you know, for any point p that we would describe in terms of a vector r, what is the velocity? And it's going to be related to the vector r and the vector omega. What exactly is that relationship? Well, we have to figure that out. Well, if we're looking down, so going back to this picture, right, 
if we're looking down and the point P is moving in a circle, this is also, it's moving steadily in a circle. So we know what the velocity should be for something moving steadily in a circle. The magnitude of this velocity for something moving in a circle should be rho times the, uh, the angular velocity rate, which I'll write as omega, a scalar. Right, so omega, the scalar, is the magnitude of omega, the vector. This is the angular velocity rate. So, I mean, it's the magnitude of that vector. So what do we got here? The magnitude of V is rho. Let's plug in what we know for rho. R sine theta um, times Omega. So that gives us the magnitude of that velocity. What if we wanted to just get the vector itself? Well, this is also, if I'm looking down, I see that this point P is moving uh, in a circle and V is perpendicular to both R and Omega geometrically. So I can I can figure out what that direction is. Um, if, if I have two vectors and I want a direction that is perpendicular to them both, I have a way of finding that and it's called the cross product. So the, the velocity V must be perpendicular to omega and R, which means it's in the direction uh, omega cross R, the cross product. And if you if you were to work out if you work out what's the magnitude of omega cross R. The magnitude of omega cross r is actually omega. It's the magnitude of each vector and then the sine of the angle between them, which, oh, lo and behold, it's the same as this up here. So the, this vector, the velocity vector of the point is equal to omega cross r. Or an, another way we'll write this, since V is the, the time rate of change of the location of that point. So it's the derivative of the vector R with respect to time. We'll sometimes write that as just R dot. So we might write this as R, let's write it as a vector. R dot is omega cross R. We should be a little bit more careful about what we mean by that derivative, but hopefully that's okay for now. So this is true. It turns out this is true even when uh, we don't have rotation about a fixed axis. So maybe I'll write turns out So this is true for any R, any vector R that is body fixed. And uh, any angular velocity omega, even if it's not about a fixed axis. So this is useful. You know, what does it mean? If I have a rigid body, let me, I've got another abstract rigid body. Here's a rigid body. Right, so it's a cube. If I wanna know, and this say this thing is rotating. rotating. So I throw it up in the air and it's tumbling. If I wanna know how, what's the velocity of this point, um, 
all I need to know is the vector from the origin of my body fixed frame, which would be the center of mass, to that point. Um, so that would be my R vector, and then cross the omega vector, whatever the omega vector happens to be, and that'll give me the velocity of that point. And it could be any point on the body, it just has to be a body fixed point. So that's helpful. There's uh, there's more to the story though. There's this thing called the the transport equation or transport theorem. And this is the key thing. This is where we will end because it is significant. Um, and this is related to viewing motion in a rotating frame. So I guess we could go back to the idea of that bug moving on the surface, but maybe I'll just, I'll draw something like this. We'll have to spend a while on the transport theorem. So we're not gonna just end it there. Um, let's look at this point. No, I don't want that point. I want something that's moving. So if I have my bug, here's my bug. And it's moving on the surface of this rigid body. I've got a frame attached to the rigid body, the body fixed frame. So B frame. The rigid body. Uh, let me give it a fancy, fancy B. And here's, here are inertial directions. So E frame is inertial. Let's draw uh, the vector from the origin O to this point P where the bug is. That's R. R from O to P. Location of the moving bug on body. If we want to relate how the, it, suppose we know what the velocity is. So, how that vector is moving, but with respect to the body fixed frame. That could be something like if I'm, if I'm on the earth and there's a car moving with respect to me, I have an idea of how that car is moving with respect to me on the earth, but of course the earth is moving. So if I wanna know how fast is that car moving with respect to the inertial frame centered at the center of the earth, I have to, I'll do some additional calculations. So this is just the uh, velocity of the point P as seen by an observer on the body fixed frame. But suppose I, I wanna know what is the derivative? What is the actual velocity as seen by the inertially fixed E frame? So this is the velocity of P as seen by an observer in the inertially fixed E frame. How are these two related? They're related through something called the transport equation. And there's another ingredient we need, which is what's the omega vector. So here's in this very light blue up here, 
I mean, what's the angular velocity of the B frame with respect to the E frame? Okay, that's almost too light. So this is the angular, the instantaneous angular velocity of the B frame with respect to the E frame. Having all those ingredients, I can write what is called the transport theorem. A name I don't quite like because it makes me think of fluids, but that's the name we're stuck with. So the, the derivative, the velocity of the point P as seen by the inertially fixed E frame is equal to the velocity of the point P as seen by the body fixed frame, but then you have to add in a part related to how the frame is rotating. But that's exactly this up here. This relates uh, for some, for this gives the relationship due to the rotation, the velocity just due to the rotation. So it's going to be plus omega of the B frame with respect to the E frame cross R. Okay. So we have, we have explanations for these, hopefully this is, uh, this is the transport equation. Again, that's the most significant thing I've shown you today. So this would be, like we said above, velocity seen by E frame. And then this is the velocity seen by the B frame. And this is the velocity due to the fact that the B frame rotates with respect to the E frame. And if you're wondering where this is, uh, so this would be, uh, they use a different symbol like N, the N frame. This is 121, equation 121. Okay, but it's very fundamental. Um, and we've written it in terms of how it relates uh, a point moving on, on, on a body but it's actually true for any vector. So this thing called the transport theorem, this equation actually holds, it holds for any vector. So let me just use a generic vector, uh, A, and actually any two frames. So it's actually quite, quite general, but um, so the inertia, the, sorry, the derivative of a vector A as seen by the E frame is equal to the derivative of a vector A as seen by the B frame plus omega, the angular velocity of the B frame with respect to the E frame cross A. So the vector A could be um, the velocity, right? Eventually we'll have to get the acceleration to start doing like dynamics, we'll have to get the acceleration. So the vector A might be the velocity, inertial velocity of that point P, or the vector A might be something else. It might be angular momentum, something. Um, but that's, that's where we will uh, stop today. And I've, I can see that there are some questions. Um, first, let me tell you, so we kind of got up through page 13 of the book. We will, sorry, yeah, of the book. So chapter one, we'll probably get to the end of chapter one by next time. So read through the end of chapter one. Um, and uh, I see, I see a question here from a while ago. I'll answer that. And if you have any other questions, you could ask them. I don't, I don't want it to disappear though. Mm. 
matrix for a coordinate frame is the inverse. Yeah, but for um, for rotation matrices, the inverse is the transpose. Yeah, yeah, okay. There's some I get it. there's some other classes where they've split hairs between how like the vector r is translated between the two frames and how the frame itself. We'll get to that later and try to clear that up. Yeah, good question. Anything else? 